All right, if you have uh, your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. Uh, when uh, Jared said Luke, I got a little nervous, but when he said 11, I started feeling better, but it rhymes with 7. Uh, Luke 7, we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Luke 7, in the very first verse, the Bible says, Now when this was ended, all his set excuse me, now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was, who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he come and heal his servant. And when they were come to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he should work, that he was worthy for whom he would do this. For he loveth our nation and have built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and he was, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord. Trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Therefore, uh, neither therefore, excuse me, wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you uh, for your love and protection on the church here at Dover. Lord, that you would guide us as a people together, that you'd give us a burden for those that live around us. God, we pray that you might fill this place this morning with your presence, that we may understand and know of a surety that we have met with you. God, we pray that you would bless this word to those that hear it. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, I want to call your attention to verse 7. And uh, he, uh, this centurion has confidence in the Lord that if he just said a word, that his, uh, that his servant would be healed. Now, uh, that's very interesting to me, and we'll get into it in a little bit more detail, that an individual would have so much faith in Christ that he knew and understood that if he just spoke it, it would be so. One little word from the Lord Jesus Christ in his personal ministry did great and wonderful things. And we will see that as we study the Word of God this morning, that it simply just takes one tiny spoken word of God and the whole situation changes. That's an amazing thing to me. Uh, that's wonderful power that I don't think I can comprehend. And whenever I, uh, whenever I begin to look at things how they are today, I have to remind myself that one spoken word of the Lord God or, or a manifestation, just a move of the Holy Ghost uh, changes everything. Right. Now, I don't understand the will of the Father, what happened down in Waverly yesterday. Uh, I don't know that he, how he will be glorified in it, but I know that he will. But could you imagine if the goodness of God, he, that's, uh, that the Lord Jesus had stopped that water? For the glory of his, own, of his own self. See, he's able to do that. Uh, we forget that in the modern age. And sometimes I think we minimize it. Because the Lord Jesus Christ now sits at the right hand of the Father. But I want you to understand and know that his power has not changed. Uh, nor it ever will. You can't limit the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot limit the power of the Lord God in heaven. And you can't limit the power of the Holy Ghost. That's an impossibility. Uh, in the first verse, now when he had ended all his sayings. Now, if you review the previous chapter, that's what is in Matthew's gospel often re referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. It's just Luke's account of the same thing. So he had preached a very long sermon. He had preached a very long time. The people were tired and they were weary and he left them and came down the mountain. Now, when he had ended all his sayings, 
and the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Now, remember this, that Christ never did anything in those three and a half years, really the 33 and a half years of his life, but especially noted in his own personal ministry, he never did anything that didn't have a purpose behind it. You know, uh, uh, sometimes here in this flesh, we waste lots of time, do we not? And uh, I was telling Jared uh, yesterday, the only thing that I really got done, anything constructive, was to, wa to wash my mailbox. It, it had green mold growing on it, and I went down there and wiped it down, and that's about the most constructive thing that I got accomplished. And you know what? I could b blame the weather. It was a mess yesterday, but it didn't rain all day. Uh, and I could blame a lot of things, but you know what the real thing was? I was wasting time. Uh, I have to take the responsibility of that, do I not? And, and, and so I want you to see in that, even, uh, even uh, not one time did the Lord do something without uh, purpose and design. You know, one time, more than once, he, he made reference of being tired. Why, how did that glorify himself? Well, he showed his carnality. He showed that even in all his deity, he had took it on the form of flesh, and that that flesh does get tired at times. And so everything that he did was to uh, was to glorify uh, and do honor. Verse two, and a certain centurion's servant. Now, remember, and if anything is ever said in my ministry, uh, I hope this will be remembered that God always deals in specifics. He never does anything in general. That's why I don't believe in a general atonement, because if that were true, all of Christ's acts and all of God's would, uh, acts would have been in a general sense. But I want you to see that he spoke of a certain centurion and a specific servant. Uh, when God begins to move and do things, it's going to be on a very, very specific level. And it's going to be individuals whom he has chosen, and he's going to work with them and through them very directly. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. Now, uh, I like that, uh, and I'm assuming physically is what this say, is saying. I don't know. Uh, I'm assuming so, because probably this was a Roman. Uh, but isn't it, a, isn't it an interesting two words, ready to die? I, I don't think they're back to back in King James Bible for nothing, do you? Uh, ready to die. That's a very good question, isn't it? Uh, are you ready to die? Uh, those those people that were swept away in Waverly, my understanding, in 10 seconds, were they ready to die? Uh, no doubt, probably some of them were not. That, that's a very troubling thing. And, and you know what? You could be gone that quick, too. That much. Ready to die. So either, and I, again, I don't think that he was meaning in a spiritual term. I believe his death was was coming very close uh, to coming, and so he was saying physically he was going down the hill. Verse three, and when he had heard of Jesus, meaning the centurion, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Now, I want you to see this centurion was interventive on behalf of uh, his, his servant, someone that worked for him, and a lot of times servants didn't get paid. They were more or less what we think of as slaves. They did not receive very much, but I want you to see they were dear to him. You know, you know it's very, very important that a pastor love his people. Each and one, every one of you, most of you are family, but listen, this role in this place is very different than me being your son-in-law and your father and your, and your husband and all that goes with that. See, when it comes down to this, you're very dear to me as my sheep. I'm the undershepherd. And that's what the centurion was, uh, was conveying. He was very dear to him not because he was under and responsible for this man, and he loved him. Uh, then verse 4, 
And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worth and that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Now, I want you to see this as some interesting things, and they very much liked this centurion, and it's unusual for the Jews to like the Romans because they were under their captivity, and they said, but this Roman is a good Roman. He built us a place to meet in. He built us a synagogue. He built us a, he built us a place where we could gather together and worship God. He's a good man. Now, you know what? That, that's a pretty good testimony. But remember this. There is none good. No, not one. You know what? Sometimes I have to look in the mirror and remind myself of that. You're no good. You, you, you're not effective. You're not... You're, you're nothing without the goodness and mercy of God. Right. And, and if you remind yourself that frequently, you won't, get, uh, you won't build pride and you won't think you're better than everybody else. You will, you will stay in an humble direction. And so they thought he was great. Verse 6. Now, then Jesus went with them. Now, do you think they convinced Jesus? I don't. I think he had every intention of going the whole time. Uh, they, they didn't persuade Christ. You can't persuade Christ. Wherefore, neither, uh, excuse me, then Jesus went with them, and, and he was now not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, not, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Now here we find a very interesting, interesting thing that the centurion has a better understanding of his own character than those Jews that lived around him. He says, listen, I'm not even worthy you come in my house. I'm a Roman. I am, I am not even a Christian. I'm not even a Jew. I, I'm not worthy for you to even be here. And remember what the Jews said about him. Oh, he's a fine fella. He's done this for us and he's done that force. You know what? Self-assessment will give you a whole lot more information than what people tell you that you are. And so he understood and knew that, that he wasn't much. That, that he, he wasn't worthy even to meet with Christ. You know what? Without his mercy and grace, you're not worthy to meet with Christ. Right. You're, you're not worthy to be in his presence. And this, this centurion understood that about himself. Verse 7, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. Not only I don't want you in my filthy, ungodly, Romanish house, I, don't, I can't even pro approach your goodness. You know what? what? What a wonderful thing to understand that, that we can't approach the person of Christ, that he comes to us. What, what, what a wonderful thing understanding of his holiness uh, what a wonderful understanding uh, of how much God he really is is that that we know that we can't approach him we, we can't come near unto his holiness this man uh, a heathen really understood that better than the Jews did wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee but say in a word and my servant shall be healed what a wonderful, wonderful understanding of the character of God. Just one word. Uh, I, I don't have this in my sermon, so I can use this to not be uh, repetitious. Whom seek ye? Remember that? And they all feel backwards. Right. Um, man, that's powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then he submitted himself and went with him. You, you, you telling me that Christ couldn't, you know, he, he could disappear, just move. That's right. Yeah. I mean, he, he he didn't need that, but he went submissively, didn't he? Fully submissively, and, and, and so we see then uh, that the that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was the very same way, understanding 
The power in the word of God. The power in the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I think we need to get back. Uh, you know, and, and those of you that are teachers and preachers, I know you've seen that. And you can see when people check out and they're not plugged in and they're not listening to you anymore. I know we've all experienced that. But you know, they cannot do that with Christ. Because he, His word is powerful. One little word. And you know what? When he's speaking through you, they'll be engaged. <laughs> and, and, and when you're not, they ain't. And so we see then as the Lord's people that uh, maybe just maybe we begin, we need to begin to study and understand the power connected in the words of Christ more and more. You know, uh, I don't know how your Bible's laid out. Mine's laid out this way. Uh, uh, the words of Christ, his quotes are written in red in my Bible. I will say this, that is not a King James distinctive. I know a lot of King James Bibles that are not printed that way. That's just a printing technique. Uh, but I'm glad because when I see them, I can, I can jump up and take some more notice. Because this is not just uh, where they're at and what they're doing. This is the very Son of God speaking and, in his own quotes. And so we see... Uh, the words of Christ contain power in and of themselves. Uh, go with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 in verse 21. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 in verse 21. And going on from thence, now uh, he had just called... Uh, his first two people that would become uh, apostles in the previous verse, verse 18, he calls Peter and his brother Andrew. He, he calls them in. Drop down to verse 20, I mean verse 19. And he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now that's about an eight word statement. He calls them to himself and he makes them a promise. Uh, now a lot of people says that he was just referring to there that would uh, uh, like he would come to me and, and would say I'm going to make you uh, a super nurse. Uh, that it's related to their occupation. I don't believe that is the text here. I believe it's promise. You follow me, and your ministry is going to be effective. Now, measuring effectiveness of a ministry is very, very difficult because we begin to measure it in numbers very quickly. You ever wondered why David ever did that census, even God specifically told him not to? Because this right here likes to measure things in numbers. That, that, that's how we're geared. And, and, and so we, we, we see here that, um, that he, uh, <laughs> that he uh, called them, uh, Peter and Andrew specifically, verse 20, and straightway, and they straightway left their nets and followed him. Uh, some people call that obedience, and I can kind of see that. But I don't know that they had a choice, do you? If we believe in an effectual call, I think we ought to believe it, don't you? He called them, and they went. Drop down to uh, verse um, 21. And going on from thence, meaning where they were fishing, he saw other two brethren, James the son of De Zebedee and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father mending their nets and he called them. Now we don't have any record specifically what he said to them. It just said that he called them and straightway they left their nets. They left the ship with daddy and they followed Christ. You know what? That's a very effective word. We don't even really know that they knew that he, they knew Christ. He did just like a stranger come up to you and say, now, uh, think about Jared. He, uh, we, we've worked together, been in ministry together for probably close to 10 years now. And I believe I said, Jared, I need some help. He come. 
But that's because we've known, I've known Jared since he was 13. Uh, we know each other, but can you imagine a perfect stranger coming up to you and say, come follow me, and doing it? I, I, I think that's an amazing power in his own words, do you not? Now, if you notice, all but one of these, Andrew, all of these individuals, Peter, James, and John, became, uh, became in, in that inner circle. They all came, became apostles, but these three abided in the inner circle, and I believe it was because how he spoke to them. Uh, how, how effective that word uh, was in their lives. You know, that's what I want is to see uh, the call of God and that power in my own life and in the lives of the people here at New Testament to see people respond in such an amazing way. The words of Christ are unbelievably, unbelievably powerful when we take a true listen. Gospel of Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says this, Now, when he came nigh to the gate of the city, meaning Christ, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much of the peop and much people of the city was with her. Now, I want you to see that uh, this old boy, I don't know how old or young he was, but they were on the way already to the cemetery. Now, uh, a little bit further up in this account, it says the, the small city of Nain, uh, N-A-I-N, and, and they had a abided there that had been their home and now he was going to be buried now uh if you understand jewish culture in the time period that sets in uh i've studied genealogy a lot here and up to the 1920s and 30s even 99 percent of the people after they died they were buried immediately on the following day because of rot uh, they didn't embalm people. They didn't have a way to prepare the body. So this individual had been dead probably at least 24 hours. And I know from personal experience being around dead bodies, listen, by 24 hours, you know it. Uh, there's no wonder. There's no, uh, that's why they used to sit up with the dead, as the old uh, saying goes. And, and listen, when they get stiff, which is about six to eight hours, you know they're dead. And so this old boy was past that point. They were carried into the cemetery, and Christ intervened. You know what? Until the Lord Jesus called Christ called me spiritually through the person of the Holy Ghost, I was just like this boy of the city of Nain, graveyard dead. But he called me. Now, no, notice, notice what, what the Lord Jesus Christ does. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, he intervenes in a wonderful, miraculous way. Verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. Now I want you to see his first words are to her. Now, uh, I've never experienced the death of the child, and I pray to the Lord I never do. But I do know this from personal experience. When Judy died, there was no comforting mother. I tried. It, it just, it, and, and, you know, the more I thought about it, I, I understood this. There would be no comforting me either. That's an emptiness nobody can feel. You can say, I'm sorry. You can say, Mother, I'm praying for you. You can take her a ham and biscuit. And you know, at the end of the day, Judy was still gone. And that's what this one. And could you imagine, and especially in the first few days Judy died, me going up to Mama and saying, Now, Mama, don't cry about this. She'd say, Well, you foolish thing. And I'm her own son. 
Could you imagine a perfect stranger coming up to, to Mama at Judy's funeral and saying, Now, Jim, don't cry. That, that's an unbelievable request, is it not? But you know what? I believe the words of Christ are so powerful and mighty, she probably did quit crying. She probably did stop. She probably uh, was able because that is in the mind of the words spoken of Christ. That is how powerful he really is. Verse 14. And he came and touched the bearer. Uh, uh, we, uh, we call them pallbearers here in the United States. Same thing. Uh, and he came and touched the bearer. And, and they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. Uh, just seven simple words. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. Now, uh, I, I, have to under, I have to understand and be content. But what a what an interesting thought. What did he say when he said up? <laughs> he said he spake. He, he said something. Would to God that we understood and knew what that was, wouldn't you? Uh, I, I can't imagine when he stood up and maybe he said, What are y'all doing with me? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's amazing to think. Maybe he just looked at Christ and said, Thank you, Lord. Uh, what a wonderful thing you've done for me. I don't know what he said, but I know he said something at seven simple words of Christ. How effective that is in our life. You know what? If you really believe, the Word of God will be very effective in your lives. Yeah. And, and, and if it's just a wash, it will never be effective in your life. And if it's just something you're going through, and just another routine that has to be done, uh, you'll never experience the fullness of Christ. I'm not saying you're lost. That's between you and the Lord. But I do know this. You'll never experience the fullness of Christ. Understand His deity. Understand who He really is and how He works. That's for people, for Him. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. Another instance. Matthew, chapter 8. Matthew, chapter 8, in the first verse. Matthew, chapter 8, in the first verse. The Bible says this. When he was come down from the mountains, this is Matthew's account of the very same thing. So he, he must have done a lot of miracles as he was coming down at the completion of the Sermon on the Mount. And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there was a leper and worshipped him. Now, I want you to see this is very interesting, too, because I think uh, faith always precedes miracles. It said that this little leper was worshipped him already. Um, listen, we don't worship Christ because of miracles. We worship him, and sometimes there are miracles that follow. Uh, your worship of Christ don't need to be limited to just simply what he does. Worship him when you're a leper. Worship him when you're bed confined. Worship him when you have cancer. Have y'all been following uh, Brother Titus and, and his treatment of his uh, esophageal cancer? Never once have I seen him uh, blame God. I've never seen him get the hummy drummies. You know what he is? He gives God praise and thanks God for every day that he's had. That, that, you know what? When a, when, when a man begins to look at things like that, I begin to look for miracles. I, I begin to look for things that, that, that are outside the normal realm of what mankind understands. I begin to look for exceptional things. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt. He knew it had to be in the will of the Almighty. He understood that it had to be in his sovereign plan. It had to be under the, the omniscience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. 
What do you think that Christ is able to do this morning? I'll say this. He's able to do anything that He wants to do. Anything is under His under His will. Now, I don't know how much of you notice it, uh, know this because I'm kind of a, a history freak and I understand that about myself. But uh, in the great earthquake uh, 1811, uh, it was so it, it was such a shake of the earth that the Mississippi River ran backwards for three days created Real Foot Lake right down here on the end of uh, Tennessee. That, that, that's who we serve. That is the very same God. Uh, if, can you imagine something so powerful that He can run a river as, as strong and as unbelievable as the Mississippi in the wrong direction? That's the God we serve. So what is outside His ability? What, what is outside His authority? Nothing. Nothing whatsoever is outside what He is, he is able to do. And so this little leper understood that. And Jesus put forth His hand <coughs> and touched Him saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy is cleansed. Now, we're down to five words now. I will. It's under my sovereignty. It's under my, it's under my distinction. I, I, I will that this I will be thou cleansed. And and you know, that was a diagnosis like stage four cancer for the Jews. Very, very, very rarely did people recover from it. That's why they threw them outside the camp because they didn't want it to spread. And uh, in five words, completely restored. Now, I don't know the advancement of his leprosy, but y'all all know how it's a consuming disease and your toes fall off and your feet fall off and your legs fall off and some of them get up to right here. And, and the thing of it is, there's no pain with it. That's what's unusual about leprosy. There, there's no pain with it. It just totally takes away who you are. You know, for the for the non for the unsaved, for the sinners, sin is not necessarily painful. Because they're accustomed to it. But it's consuming them every day. It's consuming who they are. And so, with five simple words, the Lord stopped the process. He was restored. He was made clean. He was made clean and he was made whole, just like that, at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. In verse 51. Luke 8 and uh, verse 51 the Bible says and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers <clears throat> and he sent messengers before his face and they went and I'm sorry, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elisha did? And he turned and rebuked them and says, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Now, I want you to see that <laughs> what he commands, I'm sorry, that's not the verse I wanted, but what he commands is so. I was reading in verse 9. Go with me to chapter 8. Um, I'm reading chapter 9. Go with me to chapter 8. Uh, Luke 8, verse 51. And when he came into the house, he suffered man. 
no man, and this was the healing of the dead girl, they had made fun of him. They said, she's dead already, and he says, weep not. And, and he came unto the house. He suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, the inner circle, the 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 three that was uh, that that he called specifically, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and be well, but he said, "Weep not; she is not dead, but sleepeth." Mm. Now again came this unreasonable request: "Don't cry." Don't be upset. And, and, and I can't imagine that, but what I think it really is this is a measure of your faith, a measure of your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ's ability. Uh, am I able to solve this problem? And, and, am, I, am I able to make this okay again? And, and, and so he says that. He quit crying. Verse 53, And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he, and he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. Two words, Maid, arise. And how powerful they were. How strong they were. And you know what? She, she had... She had no choice in the matter, did she? You talk about sovereignty. He didn't say, if you want to rise, rise. Made a rise. And immediately, she sat up. And she was in such good manner of health, he said, give her some meat. They didn't start her out on juice or milk, did they? He said, give her some meat. She's ready for meat. <laughs> That's an amazing thing, is it not? That... That in two simple, powerful words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that that life was restored, and she came again to herself, and her health was restored. In what? In those simple words, Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to be done. Matthew chapter fourteen. Matthew fourteen, in verse twenty-seven. Matthew 14 and verse 27. Very familiar verses of Scripture. They're in the sea. The storm is on. The wind is blowing. Verse 27. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him, said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And, Philip, and, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. One simple word. Come. You know, there's a whole lot of faith there, wasn't there? Right. You can criticize Peter, and I often do. But, man, he made that first step, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Only documentation that we have of anyone except for Christ walking on water. Now his faith got compromised, and I understand that. And he went down, but he stepped out of the boat. Right. And he began to cross the sea. He went under Christ. One simple, effective word. Come. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. That's the Christ we serve even today. Yeah. Just come. Uh, there's nothing, nothing that our God can't do. Right. What a peacefulness. What, what an easy way to bunch up your pillow and go off to sleep. There's nothing, nothing outside his will. We need to, we need to, catch hold of that in the day which we live, do we not? What a peaceable thing. What, what, a, what a wonderful power. One simple word. And, and everything, everything goes back to normal. That's what we need.